As I mentioned, my name is Anjali Padarai. I am calling in from the unceded territories of the Coast Salish, Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil peoples. I have been doing work on these lands for over a decade now, and I am um, the work that I've done in climate justice has always been inextricably tied with the histories of this land and of the resistance. Um, against land dispossession on these lands. All right, so we have a really packed couple of hours, and so I'm not going to waste too much time um, uh, with a preamble. Um, I want to take this time to just give you a quick welcome to the Climate Action Provincial Assembly. And I've been to a couple of these now. I think they're essential. The CAPA is an initiative of the West Coast Climate Action Network to bring together the members of climate action groups and other climate activists and advocates across the province to connect, coordinate, and support each other. I am a huge fan of assemblies. I think they are um, an absolutely key tool of mass social movements used extensively in struggles all over the world. They were used extensively in the civil rights struggle and they're used in an ongoing way in battles for climate justice and land determination all around the world. I love this model and that's why I'm here today. So um, I'm looking forward to all of us making use of this wonderful tool and a mass assembly that brings us all together in one place. So in this uh, Kappa in particular, we are focusing on the most pertinent things we can do today to accelerate climate action in BC. And so let's use today as an opportunity to ask questions, ask all the tough questions, have the tough conversations, learn some things from, from our incredible speakers and connect with each other uh, in, in the breakout groups, which will happen later. Um, so that we can move forward together and have more clarity and have more unity, um, more of a basis of unity for doing the absolutely crucial work that needs to happen this year. So a uh, really quick overview uh, of, of the next couple of hours. So much of the capital will be focused on the speakers. So I believe we have uh, seven speakers for you today. Uh, the event is going to go until 8.30. Um, there will be breakout rooms that will happen after the speakers, and this event is being followed up by a part two on Thursday, March 14th, and the focus of that meeting will be on hearing back from as many climate action groups as possible and on your plans to take some of the ideas that come out of this assembly and actually implement them in your work going forward. So there will be instructions about all of that at the end of this call. All right, and um, after the breakout groups, we'll just wrap up and have a quick closing before 8.30. So one of our speakers, uh, Ruben George, has another event that's waiting on him. And so he's graciously agreed to join us for a few minutes right now. And so we're gonna hear from Ruben first, and then we're gonna go to um, Guy Doncey, who's the coordinator of Weekend, um, to kick us off for the rest of the speakers. So I'm going to pass it over to Ruben. Do we have Ruben in the house? Yes, you do. All right. <laughs> awesome. Welcome to you, Ruben. Hi. Good to see you. Um, well, thank you. Um, how much time do we have? Do I have? About five minutes. Perfect. Possible. Thank you. Short and sweet. Sorry, Anna. I'm, at, um, I'm in the studio doing, doing a show, too, and... Um, they took a break so I could I could do this. This is really important. Um, you know, I, I I'm lucky enough that I, I follow our our cultural and spiritual teachings, and personally, I know it helped me tremendously out of out of a lot a lot of trouble that I got myself into when I was younger. And and um, as a collective, as a nation, we 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 try to we try to follow those teachings and and of, of trying to make the world a better place. And um, I think we, we continue to do that. Like our salmon count went down for the Indian River, went down to 6,000 for the whole year. And, and one day last year, we had 1.3 million salmon in the river at once. And, and you know, we introduced elk into our territory. A lot of these things you guys already know we did. And um, we clean, we've been cleaning the inlet that 
oysters and clams and eelgrass and it's, it's all coming back and and um you know we we believe in that and and because what i believe is we have a reciprocal relationship of spirit to the lands and to the waters that we try to thrive for and i think we were influenced by today's this western way of living to numb ourselves to those things that really matter and um and and we see that and we know that's important and what's sad to me is you know um at one time last summer there was four over 400 forest fires happening in british columbia and um you, you, you look how a couple of years ago that vancouver was cut off from the rest of canada because the floods are are you see all those things happening globally and and you know i what, what comes to my mind and is is like how how would we explain some of these things to our great grandparents you know when you look at, at back how they used to live before half of our world species of have, have died or or 60% of our mammals have died and and 6 65% of that is what's left of that is livestock and just explaining the fires, and like I said, the floods and all these things happening all over the world, I think they'd be really puzzled. And I think every single one of our great grandparents would say, well, what are you doing about it? And for sure, there isn't enough people doing things about it. And, and so hand in hand, um, as well as fighting the, the pipeline, I've been speaking a lot about my book. Uh, you know, it stops here. And what I do talk about is, is what people need to do. And what I hope them they need to do is go out and be a part of those things where we live, the water, the mountains, the forests, all those things, and, and try to gain something from that to, to do something about it. And, and, um, but also not only that, but, um, some friends and I, we, we started a green, a green company of, of creating hydrogen. And, and, um, it's a no brainer. It's, it's to, to try to do something that is counter to that. Like, you know, I, for 13 years now, we've we've been saying no to this pipeline. You know, it's still not over. We still got a long way to go, but we've been saying no to this pipeline, and we continue to say no, and we'll continue to fight it. Even even if they complete it, they're not going to sell it, and we're trying to make sure of that. You know, it's whether they try to give it to First Nations and eliminate that debt, it's still going to be economic smallpox. And we're encouraging everybody to do their due diligence and to see to recognize that it's a stranded asset. But you know, I will continue that. And, and that's a big part of who I am and who I'll always be, but also helping people. It's easy to identify people who need help that live through trauma, like a lot of my people who went to residential school. But what I believe is there's a really, really bad globally um, spiritual trauma, because if, if spirit touched this the way it did to me and, and my family and my nation, we wouldn't be making these decisions that we're making. So I work with people that want to create that difference. I work with people who who are in different levels of government to 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 create a foundation that that is based on protecting things that we love, lands, water, and people. And that that's that's why also we 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 got into business and wanted to create hydrogen. You know, we work with First Nations who own a dam, and and we're using that. We want to use that energy to create hydrogen, and um. So that's what we've been doing, and that's what we continue to do. And you know, I and I appreciate what everybody's doing here. And and you know, we, we when we look at where we live here in British Columbia, we 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 go to those places that make us feel good. You know, a lot of you doing environmental work, you you're out on the lands, you're out on the water. And, you know, especially here in Vancouver, it's it's raining. Doesn't matter. Go to the mountains. Everyone does that. Go go kayaking you know we we do all those things because we feel blessed when we do it we feel really blessed and, and I, I just hope more people do that and because our future looks bleak look at look at the right now you guys all know this that the snowpack is only 40 percent and and the, and the snow runoff is going to be at a, at a at a staggering pace of the, probably dwindling to some rivers to nothing some of the estuaries nothing and, and salmon go up those rivers and, and it, it doesn't look good for the future of our salmon. And, you know, all these things that are dying, it, it's, it's crazy because it's it's the canary in the mine shaft, those animals, and it doesn't look good. So I really appreciate all what you do and how you're doing it and how you incorporate those values of what we do into the work that you do to create success and open some eyes to people who, 
who need it because they all drink water, they all breathe air, and they all want to eat something. They all want. of what we're seeing these disasters happening it's 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 going to get worse <laughs> so I, I thank you all thank you angeline thank you for all the organizers and thank you my 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 friends who are speaking after me and I, I, again I, I i'm sorry that i have to go and but for real some really big love and blessings to each and every one of you and all the really good beautiful work that you do and protecting and we love so i'm just so appreciative and again i really apologize i have to Go do some work downstairs. <laughs> so thanks, thanks Angeline. We love you. Bye. Have a good one. Um, thank you so much to Ruben. Bye, Ruben. Good luck with the next thing. Uh, thank you so much to Ruben. That was such a wonderful way to ground us and bring our hearts into this moment. And so with that, I'm going to pass it off to Guy. Hi, everyone. Um, welcome. Um, I'm privileged to live on the traditional unceded lands of the Stuminas First Nation near Ladysmith, a town named after a British colonial battle in South Africa. <laughs> I'm going to briefly introduce, um, we can, if I can just find the right share button. So, so this is the right to the science. This is global temperature above pre-industrial levels. Look how we're so out of whack here. And this is the ocean temperatures, so completely out of whack. This is the picture of where we're heading to 3.4 degrees or so. This, is, this has got danger written all over it. And this is what's happening last week. This is what it means for this town on the coast of Chile, where, you know, town of 300,000 caught fire. And these are our climate goals. As Germany, 65% reduction by 2030. Europe, IPC, Subarica, BC down at 40, and we're not on track to get that. So we have 235 member groups in WeCan. Just think what we could achieve if we all pulled together. Um, you can find them all listed at the website at the bottom at westcoastclimateaction.ca. That's, that's our strength. We have a weekly newsletter that goes out to some 4,000 people. If you don't get it already, you can get it on westcoastclimateaction.ca, our website. And that's our board of directors, all volunteers. Three years now we've been at this, incredibly hardworking people. Um, I had personally 250 meetings last year <laughs> to account how much work we're putting into all this. And now I'm going to introduce um, Chief, Chief um, Judy. So I need to stop sharing. Um, Judy Red Hummingbird Woman is a member of the Nisconleith Indian Band and an intergenerational survivor. Judy's father attended the Kamloops Indian Residential School. She served for 10 years as chief of the Nisconleith Indian Band, eight years as a council member, and is past secretary treasurer of the Union of BC Indian Chiefs. She's a strong advocate for the recognition of inherent title and rights and self-determination, and passionately devoted to ending violence towards indigenous women and girls. And she's experienced firsthand the pain and grief of losing a loved one after her sister was murdered over 20 years ago. Judy, over to you. Uh, thank you, uh, White Kupaita, uh, uh, Red Hummingbird Woman. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Uh, I believe I was chief for 16 years and council for eight. So I guess that bio is a little dated, but uh, served about 25 years uh, on uh, for political uh, and advocacy on behalf of our people. I'm still on many, many different tables. But what I wanted to share tonight was about the interconnectedness and caretaking uh, from our perspective as Indigenous people. Uh, as mentioned uh, in the opening tonight by Ruben, when we talk about our seasonal grounds, you know, they include the hunting and the harvesting and, you know, our elders um, lay out what our responsibilities are and our roles that we have. It's an interconnectedness to Mother Earth, the water and all of creation. So, you know, that's uh, where a lot of the sacredness comes from, because we know that uh, it's not just for us, it's for everyone, including, you know, everything I just mentioned. And they're not resources to us, they're relatives, and they guide us culturally and spiritually, which is important because there's messages and teachings and everything. So you can imagine um, 
with all of the uh, impacts uh, to the loss of our wildlife, uh, the loss of the um, the land and the water, and all of the things Guy just mentioned that are being destroyed right now because of the man-made crisis that we have. Even the migratory systems of animals is being disrupted. There was just a report, uh, I think, last week about it. So they're anticipating hundreds and hundreds of animals, or birds, sorry, uh, migratory birds being um, affected by that. And I think the Vancouver Island Health just recognized as well how disruptive climate crisis and the changes that are happening to our health and food systems are a main part of uh, what's going to impact us. So we don't have to look very far uh, into the news headlines to see how devastating this is. And as also as mentioned by Ruben, it comes down to us, us like what are we going to do? I've been internationally to many different COPs and uh, about the climate uh, change and crisis, and we did our best to hold the state governments, uh, you know, to that, you know, reducing the emissions and, you know, doing all this work, but it just seems like it's falling on us all the time. So it's really important uh, we continue our protocols to, to all of our relatives and to Mother Earth and the water the protocols, you know, in taking care of them and also looking at better stewardship, uh, even though we're in a climate crisis and that we don't interfere with, with the um, the animals and their cycles and the seasonal rounds. And, you know, the especially with these migrating birds now that are their systems, their whole migratory system is affected uh, because the importance of the balance and harmony and all of these things is going to be important because uh, if the birds don't finish their migration, there's like a ripple effect. So we can already see how that's going to affect us uh, for every one of those species that that um, are dependent on their migratory routes. And even we've seen with the uh, climate crisis affected the jet streams, it knocked the uh, polar vortex right off. So that's why we had that real Arctic cold there earlier this year. And then also um, the uh, emissions were being trapped in the oceans. So the moisture went up into the jet streams. So we had moisture jet streams. So then they had a deluge of uh, water in uh, California. And then uh, just to, during the week or two, the same time in Chile, as you've seen with that slide, the devastating fires, but we don't even have to look very far to see these devastating fires in BC. We've had just about everything so far, uh, even just across the lake from where I live. Uh, you know, that was the little Shishop Lake Indian Band uh, fire where they lost a lot of homes and structures uh, that is going to take a long time in rebuilding. And we're still recovering and rebuilding from the uh, Lytton fires uh, that happened in uh, the canyon. So, and the floods and the fires over at, in the Cap'n, over in Upper Nicola, then, or sorry, the Nicola Valley, you know, that's really devastating. And it's just gonna cost more and more to do the recovery and, and that. So they, I would say there's so much work on so many levels. Um, it, the fight isn't over. It's now more than ever, we need every single person um, to be standing up and to be able to do the work that's needed to be able to turn this around. And a lot of that is um, changing our way we uh, are as consumers and changing the way uh, what we're investing in. Because a lot of the, um, when I went down to uh, Houston, Texas for the Trans Mountain Shareholders Meeting, you know, we were able to, to change a few of their uh, proposals that they had, uh, two of the three. Um, they didn't accept the climate change one, which was unbelievable. But anyway, um, that was the one that we didn't think, that we thought they would accept. Anyway, when I got back, um, you know, the reporter asked me, they said, well, uh, did you know the BC Pension Fund is part of the Trans Mountain? And I didn't know that. Like I said, well, I think it's up to the uh, teachers and you know, all of the public servants that invest in the, their pension fund to be able to, to say they don't want their pensions to be invested in these uh, 
you know, the um, fracking oil and the uh, dirty oil and gas, mm -hmm. which is the tar sand oil. So there's things we can do. Uh, we always say we, we want to hold the banks accountable, those that are investing accountable, and the government who actually purchased the Trans Mountain Pipeline. But we ourselves need to be accountable as well and say we don't want our investments to be invested in these things. So we can imagine what we could have did with 39 billions of dollars. We could have probably been uh, further ahead on, on these issues where proper investments were going up anyway okay, i just perfect. wanted to <laughs> highlight the difference in our caretaking our interconnectedness to you know the land the water and and all the creation and you know how we can do things more simpler um for example my mom is building out uh, her own village where people come in you know from the schools from the recovery centers uh from uh universities uh they come in and listen to her uh she does uh land-based activities with harvesting medicines and, you know, being being on the land. And, you know, uh, just one quick story before I end is I wasn't taking notice of some things. And when she went out to harvest some of the medicine, the Devil Club, I went out there uh, where her area is and um, it was actually small leaves and they were yellow and my mom said we couldn't really take much from them. So we didn't. And, um, uh, that's what the indicator was. The land was dry and everything was really drying out. And that's supposed to be a wet belt area because uh, they have cedar trees. And that's where the fire was at the Little Shushop Lake area. Uh, that's how dry it was in the forests. And uh, I, we had to go down to the Cholak area uh, to harvest some of the Devil's Club. So th there's a lot of indicators on the land. Uh, we see them. But again, how, you know, what do we need to do? Uh, we need to be innovative. We need to work together. We need to find out those solutions, be more uh, aware where our dollars are being invested in, and also continue to work together with the advocacy, the education, and the awareness. And uh, I just want also will put in the chat a, a, a film that we just finished called uh, Point of No Return. I was just one of the interviewees in it. Uh, included what sued and I believe it included Soilatooth and uh, myself. So I'll put it in the ch uh, chat, uh, the link for point of no return. So it talks about climate change and the um, the uh, uh, climate crisis and the wildfires. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, um, Cookie Judy Wilson. We are so honored and privileged to have you open the event up for us. Um, and thank you for grounding it in reality and story and um, the reality on the ground right now. So thank you for opening it up in such a good way for us. We're so grateful. All right. Um, our next speaker is a, uh, my colleague uh, and um, a, a mentor and friend of mine, Seth Klein and he is Director of Strategy with the Climate Emergency Unit. Um, prior to that, he served for 22 years as the founding director of the BC Canadian Center for Policy Alternatives. He is also author of the fantastic book, A Good War, Mobilizing Canada for the Climate Emergency, which I'm sure many of you have read. Unfortunately, Seth couldn't be with us on the call today, uh, and so he has very generously recorded a video message for all of us. So I'm going to ask our tech team to please play that video message. Hello, friends. Seth Klein here, joining you joining you from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil waututh nations. I'm sorry that I can't join you live. I had to pre-tape this, as tonight I'm at a farewell and thank you event for my friend and longtime colleague, Shannon Dobb, who is stepping down as BC Director of the Canadian Centre for Policy Alternatives. So we're tasked with how to accelerate BC's climate movement in five minutes or less, so let's jump right to it. There is a provincial election in October. And we need to do everything that we can to make the climate emergency and the need to ramp up our response a central issue. Nature and the earth, sadly, will be helping to make that case, as there is every reason to think that this coming summer, which will serve as the backdrop to that election, will be even hotter than last summer. It may well be another summer of devastating fires, 
And this time we may be looking at severe drought to boot. So we need to seize on these realities to demand a genuine climate emergency response. Our movement has a long list of things we wanna see done to confront this crisis. But in truth, the most immediate central focus is on one thing, gas, specifically the fracked gas that the industry wants to carry to the coast and super cool and ship overseas in liquid form and the gas we burn in our homes. Our most urgent task is to force our government to stop making things worse with new LNG approvals and allowing new homes to hook up to gas lines so that we can then focus on the slightly longer term task of making things better. That means getting a clear rejection on Salism's LNG and Tilbury and LNG Canada phase two. And it means the government making a clear commitment that new homes and buildings must be all electric or geothermal. Okay, but how? Guy asked us to, to, to share three things we think would be most effective. So number one, we need to change the script folks and excite people with big and captivating ideas. As a movement, we have been boring people. Too many of our groups are deep into policy details that are impenetrable to much of the public. We wonk out talking about output based pricing mechanisms and zero carbon building codes and carbon contracts for difference and low carbon tax credits. My God, we're putting people to sleep with this esoteric technocratic mumbo jumbo. Instead, we need to captivate people with big ideas that are congruent with the crisis and that simultaneously speak to people's deep economic anxieties. So we need to we need billions of dollars more spent on transformative climate infrastructure that will employ tens of thousands of people. Rather than trying to incentivize heat pumps with inadequate rebates, let's just propose that every household with an income under 75,000 just gets a free heat pump. That's what they do in PEI. Let's talk about free public transit and huge subsidies for e-bikes to liberate people from those, those transportation expenses. And let's talk about windfall profits taxes and suing the corporations that got us into this mess. Number two, on that big idea score, it will come as no surprise that I invite groups to join in the call for a youth climate corps. Obviously, I'm partial on this one, uh, we, you know, but I say this because a win is within reach. We can get a strong commitment out of this election, and it would send a transformative signal that we are shifting into emergency mode and communicate to a young generation that we have a place and a role for them to meet this moment. According to polling we commissioned, hundreds of thousands of young people get the emergency and they are ready to serve, and it's time that we issued them a grand invitation. And third, on the gas file, I think the time has come to collectively undertake more peaceful civil disobedience. There are thousands of people, including our own supporters, who feel the, the disconnect between the crisis we face and the solutions on offer. I think that they're ready for, for us to ask them to do something big. Like we saw in the US with the, with the Keystone XL fight or at Standing Rock. And as our US allies just threatened to do again in Washington DC, and it seems like the very threat of that pushed Biden to announce his freeze on new LNG approvals. We need to consider that. But it won't work if it's just one or two groups. It has to be a collective movement decision with, with a grand call out and some clear strategic targets. Maybe it's the cabinet offices, but, but I think it, it, it should also be about targeting the fossil fuel companies themselves. Maybe it's Fortis headquarters in Burnaby, but one way or another, we need to, to, to take this up a notch. We have been telling people it's an emergency. And now friends, we need to act accordingly, like our lives depend on this, because they do. Thanks. That was a fantastic message from Seth. Um, even though he's not here, feel free to put some uh, appreciations or reflections in the chat. Um, I couldn't agree more. It's time to be in emergency mode and it's time to um, to align our strategies and our tactics and all of our plans accordingly. And that's what these assemblies are really for. And that's why I'm so glad to be here today. So um, along those lines, I'm thrilled to introduce our next speaker, who is Janelle Lapointe. 
Janella Point is an Afro-Indigenous climate justice and Indigenous rights activist from the Stilatin First Nation. She's Interim Director of Public Engagement and Mobilization at the David Suzuki Foundation. She leans on her lived experience to ensure that intersectionality is at the forefront of environmental narratives, to build power, and to help others see their stake in fighting back against the status quo. Thank you so much, Janelle, my friend, for being here. Uh, it's good to see your face, and um, I will let you take the floor. Yeah, good to see you, and good to see you all. Hadith and Humzu, hello, good day. Susie Janela Point, Salatan Inkez, Huxilio Asli, Makriam Skalmish, Slewitu, Hubu Yonkat, Etsa Njanasya. My name is Janela Point. I'm from Salatan in the northern interior of so called BC, um, but calling in today from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish, and Tsleil-Waututh Chief Nations. Um, yeah, so happy to be here. And I just got back to so-called Vancouver last Saturday after spending several weeks back home in the village of Stella, my, my home community. And I feel like what I'm going to share today are some big pictures I, ideas, but are things that are really deeply informed by my recent trip back home. Yesterday, I spoke on a panel about intersectional environmentalism at the Globe Forum. And I had an audience question that was asking, if we do intersectional environmentalism right, how will we know we have arrived? And how will we know we are winning? And who knows what I had to say to answer that then, but I know today as I was preparing for the session and reflecting on my time back home, the answer felt clear. I will know we are winning when I can feel the climate movement at home. And unfortunately, the last several years, um, I have often felt the opposite as I watch the oil and gas industry encroach further and further on my territory. They have built strong relationships with leaders in the area. And it seems every time I'm home, I see a new billboard claiming that LNG is going to lower Canadian emissions, that the clean fuel to use in our homes, or even more disturbing to me personally, that Canadian LNG is Indigenous LNG. My community just shut down uh, their, their sawmill, which has been a long-term source of employment for my community, and a lot of people are wondering what's next, and there's not a clear alternative for those people. All of these things combined with the devastating wildfire season that happened last year, with fires that stayed in the Ember State all through winter and reignited during this warm February that we've been having, uh, the lack of snowpack and my, my worry about the impacts that I'll see in my community <clears throat> next year are all um, impacting how I'm showing up today. And so I hope these things that I'm sharing today um, will help us all, bring us all closer to seeing the impact of a powerful climate movement what I share today um, will help us bring us closer to to my my dream of seeing a strong movement in a northern and rural community like my, myself. So my first recommendation I want to bring forward is building reciprocal relationships with Indigenous communities. And I know everyone wants more details than that. And they want to know who, what, and how. But I'm not going to go into specifics because I think every climate group has the responsibility to figure out what that looks like in nations whose territory you organize on. And if you're letting urgency or fear or ego getting in the way of figuring out how to do that, you're getting in your own way and you're also getting in our way. We know that indigenous people have been the strongest force against extraction in this country. And we also know that they have love, culture, language and governance structures that have made them the only people to survive sustainably on these lands. And I also know that waiting for them to have snipers on them before the climate movement throws down behind them is also a form of extraction. And so what we need to do is truly center our organizing on engaging with these communities as sovereign nations, being accomplices, being good allies. Um, and I think that will be key to our movement success. Second, we need to be organizing every GA people and meeting them where they're at. And simply put, I think this means like giving people clear tasks that they can do, ways they can join our movement, whether they are already an activist, whether they're a student, a worker, or a parent. And I think learning to organize 
institutions where these folks are already convening daily and always orienting ourselves to those who have not joined us yet can have the opportunity to build a powerful and winning movement. And third, I think right now is the moment to tell the true narrative of the climate crisis, one whose roots are rooted in colonialism and capitalism, and to finally properly frame the villain, which is not you or I, it is the billionaires, the corporate elites, and the oil executives who have been torching our planet for price profit. And I think this kind of storytelling is powerful, not only because it's the truth, but because it has the opportunity to connect us with other movements for change and to also bring in other people whose top concern may not be the climate right now. And maybe the affordability crisis, the health crisis, the drug poisoning, et cetera. I had the opportunity to bring those people in to show that we're united uh, against the common enemy and that we're more powerful together. And the Davis Suzuki Foundation has launched a petition to call for a windfall tax in the upcoming budget to finally make these polluters pay. We're working to end the social license on this egregious um, profiteering that we've seen in our country. And I will happily share that in the chat. Um, and also Common Horizon, which is the new social movement organization that I'm also a part of, um, has also just launched our Instagram today. And our work is really focused on these three things. So I would love a follow and to connect there and to keep sharing learnings. And then I'll also share in the chat um, a link to the website for Future Ground Network, which is the David Suzuki Foundation's um, distributed organizing project that supports and connects groups um, doing good work just like yours. Um, so I would love if you can check out the website and would love to hear from you if you think there's ways you can support the great work that you're doing. Um, a say that's it. Natalia, thank you so much for having me. I'm really encouraged by all the good work you're doing and really great to see hundreds of people in this, this room right now. Um, I'm gonna have to hop off soon after the call. So um, yeah, just thank you for, for sharing your evening with us today. Um, I'm now gonna pass it on to Kai Nagata. Kai lives on Gitsan territory in Northern BC, a former journalist. He spent the last 10 years at Dogwood working together to decarbonize, decolonize and democratize BC. And when he's not stuck behind a laptop, Kai enjoys gathering food in the great outdoors. And I can personally attest to how delicious that food is. Um, over to you, Kai. Thanks, Janelle. Thanks, Anjali and Guy and everybody for joining the call. Uh, so we were asked to come up with three ways to accelerate the climate movement in BC, and I'll do my best in five minutes. Great. Number one, um, I think we should listen to what our neighbors are telling us. And in this election year, we have no shortage of polls telling us that the number one concern of British Columbians is around affordability. And it just so happens that a huge trade-off of exporting gas from British Columbia is that it will raise energy prices for all British Columbians, whether they are Fortis BC ratepayers or BC Hydro ratepayers, these LNG export terminals are going to deepen the cost of living crisis for people all across the province, including the most energy insecure households. There's a million households in BC that are still hooked up to the gas network. And at this point, because of the weak incentives that Seth described earlier, many people don't feel like they have an alternative. And yet they are going to be asked to pay the price of exporting this gas so that the fracking companies and pipeline companies can earn even more money than they already do. And so I would encourage us as we look at our campaigns and how we talk to our neighbors and friends about these issues uh, to really focus on affordability this year and to look at examples from Australia and the United States where LNG exports directly led to massive increases in gas bills. Rather than shaming people for not being able to afford to heat pump or uh, for not being ready to make the leap uh, or for imbibing too much industry propaganda. I think we need to, as Janelle said, meet people where they're at and acknowledge these concerns uh, and then work together to build a common front uh, so that ordinary people are not being punished and forced to bear the costs of these export industries. Um, I mentioned BC Hydro, and I'll just quickly say that even if you're not hooked up to the Fortis Gas Network, all of us are being forced to pay for infrastructure to electrify these gas export terminals. And that means more dams, more pipeline or more um, substations and transmission lines, 
And these companies are blackmailing our government to provide them with free power in order to uh, reduce their carbon emissions here in British Columbia. This is a false choice. It's not one that we can accept. And I think that we should really tap into some old fashioned uh, populist anger around being forced to pay the freight for these companies. Uh, number two, I wanna talk about water and that's because we are entering probably the most dire situation any of us has faced in our lifetimes in terms of the availability of fresh water in British Columbia. It's not a resource that any of us ever thought we would run out of in our lifetimes. I can say coming from a farming family that it is already happening. Uh, last year, people all across BC ran out of hay for their cattle and had to import it from Western states and from Alberta. That's not a sustainable solution. This year, we are seeing wells dry up uh, in the north and we are seeing streams, as Ruben described, dry up uh, for fish. And it is February. So as we approach the summer, we are gonna face some hard choices around water use in BC. And we can have water for fish, for farms, uh, or for fracking, but we can't have all three. And I think that an industry that uses and destroys as much water as the fracking industry does in BC has to be held to account. And we have to force policymakers to come down hard on companies that are removing water permanently from the hydrological cycle, that are destroying our most precious natural resource. Uh, we can't let that happen. We certainly can't let it happen at the rock bottom rates that they're allowed to do it. And uh, in this year where we're gonna face drought across Western Canada, but especially in the Northeast, uh, we have to force our government to regulate in the public interest and to reserve water for more important uses than corporate profit. And finally, um, just to echo uh, things that many speakers have said before, I want to encourage all of us as the situation becomes more intense and as the land becomes more stressed to really deepen our love for and relationship to the land. And this might feel counterintuitive, but the, the antidote to despair and the catalyst for action is to build and deepen a reciprocal relationship to become part of the ecosystems around us. I'm not talking about appropriating indigenous practices or cultures, but I'm talking about in whatever way makes sense to you in the place where you live, um, having a relationship with the world around you that is not just aesthetic or abstract, but embodied. And whether that means building soil and growing food or uh, feeding birds or gathering mushrooms or shellfish or maybe fishing or hunting, uh, making those molecules part of your body, immersing yourself in the water and drinking the water in the place that you're from is not just a way to revive your spirit and give you the, the energy that you need for this fight, but it's also the early warning signal. It's the way that you understand what is happening to the land around you and the way that you can be its most effective advocate um, by being part of it rather than observer of it. Climate change is not happening on spreadsheets or social media, it's happening on the land. And so we are all behind our computers tonight, but I would encourage us as much as possible this year to spend as much time as we possibly can in relationship with the land around us and, uh, and really building that love because it's the only thing that's gonna carry us through. I wanna introduce our next speaker, uh, Manvi Bala. She's the co-founder and president of the national youth-led climate justice nonprofit, Shake Up the Establishment. She's also co-founder and vice chair of the national nonprofit, Misinformed, which is dedicated to improving the health of women and gender diverse people. Alongside her organizing, Manvi is also a full-time PhD student at UBC and with over 15 years of community organizing experience, she's a leader in taking an intersectional justice approach to address inequities in health and well-being for underserved groups. I wanna pass it over to Manvi. Hi. Hi, thank you so much, Kai, for the introduction. And yeah, thank you so much for inviting me, everyone. It's really like an honor to be amongst these amazing peers and speakers and colleagues and people that I work with and also look up to. So just expressing gratitude for that. Um, I talk a lot and I only have five minutes. So <laughs> I would do my best. And honestly, I just want to say, um, hopefully I'm quite approachable. I think I know a lot of people here and, I, and I've had great conversations. So if anybody wants to continue chattering on, I really welcome you and invite you to reach out to me. But without further ado, I will get started. Um, so yeah, as Kai mentioned, I, I've been a leader in organizing spaces for 15 years, literally since I was like 10 years old, I'm 26 now. Um, and I've always kind of tried to work, uh, I also work on these issues within academic and research spaces, but I've really kind of had a lot of opportunities to 
um, explore what working in these spaces across differences, uh, like with individuals with differences in their positionality and their worldviews, working towards a common goal. And um, I critically, as part of this, I've also worked towards developing effective communication mediums to reach audiences across these manufactured divides, whether it be partisan politics or differences in priorities within our own organizing spaces. So like even within the plethora of fantastically experienced speakers, we've had such a a diversity in priorities and of course some common through lines but you know there's there's always going to be differences and it's a great it's great because it means we have a lot of great work to do and we can all do it together um so when asked about my three key pieces of guidance of course as somebody with adhd i'm like how will i ever organize this and of course i started with conversation so after conversing with members of my community loved ones my partner who offers like a refreshingly non-organizers take which i think is part and parcel of what I'm going to share with you, um, kind of just thinking about how we can reach people outside of this space is a core theme with my thinking. And so that's kind of what I'll take you through some thoughts on. Um, the first really, I want to mention this, and I mentioned this first, because it always gets put to the end in everything that I attend. And I thought, let me flip the script a little. The first is that I really think we should be looking into the importance of using art as a creative communication, uh, the critical medium for communication and progressing the necessarily the necessary societal shift in values to sustain and bolster support for our organizing work. Hang on with me because I do work across many of the campaigns mentioned here, but not 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 is this uh, only is this not a priority oftentimes uh, within what? our organizing spaces. It's also something that kind of is an afterthought in communications about how we like push these campaigns to the wider public and as part of these conversations I've been having, particularly with young people that I work with in so many different spaces, yeah, um, blood, a quote right? that kind of really stood out to me uh, that ties all these th thoughts together um, was from the Climate Museum in New York. And it said, the role of the artist is to make the revolution irresistible. And this was Tony Cade Bambera. And I think this is a fantastic grounding quote for my first priority suggestion, which is that I think many of us know that music and art have always functioned as critical mediums to progress cultural shifts. You can think about so many different kind of like different cultures, whether it's skateboard culture, rock music, different kind of things. But I want us to tap into these um, mainstream kind of avenues to reach everyday people because so many of us care so critically and this is a great way that we can reach people. And I know that many, many young people are using these things already. So for some of the other audiences, I just want to like bring this to light because I just feel this is something that we should be doing more of. I mean, the popularization of shaking up the establishment or being cool to care really originated from counterculture movements. Um, and so I don't want us to underplay the importance of effective communication, creativity, reaching people in different audiences, using fun aesthetic ways to do so because nobody's going to read a boring policy brief. We will do it. They won't do it. So I want us to get creative. And I think that's really part and parcel is how are you packaging all this work? And is it really going to reach the people that we really want to engage? Um, I can say for a fact, when I was younger, it was not very cool to care. And over the last few years, it's become very visibly, accessibly cool to care. And a, a big part of that is that we've made it trendy to care. And I think that's really important. Unfortunately, sometimes I know it gets taken away in the opposite direction, but I think it is a great entry point for people. Leading into something more critical, more critical thought, I would say, is that a second priority I strongly feel through conversation with so many young people that I work with is we need a cultural shift that brings more everyday people into the practice of community care and caring about their local environment, as well as building relationships that foster resiliency. As we know, the more connected we are, the more we care for our neighbors, the more we care for our community, the stronger we are, we can come together and we can face the changes that are happening all around us and, you know, affecting all of us. So I think this view that I'm kind of seeing more and more that's coming about with many young people and youthful movements, especially, is that it's our personal responsibility to care about the world around you. It's nobody else's job, it's our own job, each of us to do our part as best we can. And under this view, engagement and advocacy is also considered more naturally a consistent way of life. It isn't reactionary, it's, it's moving upstream, it's sustained long-form impact. 
It's just something we do every day. We're moving towards utopias, but it's going to require us consistently holding political accountability, consistently ensuring we care, we take rest, we keep working. And it means that we um, just make this into the everyday fabric of our lives. And I think with this mindset, we're not doing reactionary politics always. We're doing like strategic like putting our energy where we know we have great impact, keep working slowly on the other things and like keep making progress. But really being strategic means like not thinking this is going to be solved overnight. We know that it's not. And it's going to be that even when we do, I know we will address this crisis, even when we do deal with the immediate impacts of the climate crisis and other co-occurring crises, the work does not stop. The work of caring for each other does not stop. And so that is a culture that I think we need to perpetuate. And how we get to that point is I guest lecture at UBC. I ask who voted. They ask me, why are we even voting? It doesn't do anything. There is a mass disillusionment. I know we've mentioned the provincial election and everything, but like people don't know the power of even like local politics. I'll ask them, how many of you voted in the city council elections? one in 40 will raise their hand. They just, they're like, I don't care. At this point, the federal government, I don't even see anybody representing me provincially. I don't think so either. Locally, I don't even know who's running. So like I've seen amazing campaigns with like women transforming cities, Sue Big Oil. What they do is they give people the blueprint through a campaign. Here's your local council. Here's how you can reach them. You teach people this blueprint really in a centralized, localized manner. Now they know who their city councilors are and how to reach them for any and all issue. And that's almost creating a habit of voting. So like if we stop kind of thinking so big with federal and provincial right now, even if we just focus locally, teaching everyday people how they can re-engage locally in their own backyard, next federal election, okay, maybe they'll vote because they're actually like, okay, I know my city councilors have seen change happen, but it doesn't happen by just doing mass scale get out the vote campaigns or, or canvassing even. It's really like culture building, habit, habit forming, you know, when it comes to voting and political engagement. Um, running out of time as usual. Last thing I want to kind of highlight too is that leaders of groups need to ensure members of their groups are engaging in ongoing learning about the interconnectedness of social and ecological issues. Even um, this summer, I was working for Northern, BC's Northern Health Authority, and a big part of our work there with climate adaptation mitigation is like, how do we progress the issue and not forget about the very real root cause of the climate crisis? Like the climate crisis, in my view, is this is a symptom of a diseased system. You know, we have so many intersecting systems and, and cultures of domination and oppression and extraction that are like creating the conditions for this to exist. So like not forgetting that, but it is quite hard for everyday people on the ground to first learn about their city council, blah, 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 and then also connect it to systems issues. So leaders of spaces, I ask and I urge, please make it an ongoing habit to just keep learning, keep an open mind, keep learning every day. I'm, I'm learning every day too. I can't believe I was invited here to share that with you, but I, I'm so happy to say that. And I think um, this is something my groups, all the groups that I engage in, I advocate for at least monthly member learning horizontally across the different social locations, positionalities, worldviews, even topics that you might not think are connected. They're probably connected. And like building those connections is a form of not only building communication, uh, building um, community and like connections within your community, but also like increasing our own kind of understanding that like we'll show up for you guys and you show up for us. And technically we're all showing up for the same thing because all these issues are very connected. It takes time, it takes years almost for some people to really build a strong foundation and in seeing the interconnectedness of socioecological issues. So starting that early um, and help, hopefully that means that all of the policy interventions you design are also intersectional by design. Because a lot of the time my group gets called in to help fix campaigns. And that means that we have to kind of start fixing the policy asks because they were kind of not made not made from an intersectional perspective and that wastes a lot of time. So if we can all just commit to this learning alongside the work, hopefully our members that join our community, even if they're newer to the stuff, can kind of begin to build those connections. So when time comes for the next policy ask, we're asking critical questions like, are we being race conscious? Are we being gender-based? Are we being sex specific in our design with our policy asks to ensure that we're moving towards a sustainable, thriving future. So 
pardon my everywhereness. I hope it's okay. My ADHD is like full swing today, but I, uh, again, I'm so grateful to share space with you all and hopefully it wasn't too quick. <laughs> I'll um, introduce the next person. I am going to my list here. Kiki. I would love to introduce Kiki Wood, uh, a climate strategist, foodie and adventurer. She works at Stand Earth as their senior oil and gas campaigner and is the board chair of My Sea to Sky, a Swamish-based organization which is fighting the wood fire, wood fiber LNG plant. When she's not at climate work, Kiki can be found in nature or in the garden. I'll pass it to you. Thank you so much, Manvi. Um, it's a real privilege to uh, be joining today from the unceded, unsurrendered territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, the Songhees and the Esquimau, um, from the place typically known as Esquimalt, um, Victoria. Uh, and a real privilege to yeah, share this virtual space with everybody here today and all the incredible speakers. Uh, I'm thrilled to go <laughs> um, seventh because I think there's been so much incredible wisdom shared this evening already. And I think the things that I have to say will be um, not new, I think, to anyone, um, but hopefully um, help to underscore the importance of them um, as actions that we can all take. Um, so when I was reflecting on the question specifically around how we accelerate uh, our movement, not just sort of fix the problems are at that are at hand. A lot of what came to mind was the importance of how we do things as much as what we're doing. Um, and I came up with many of the same thoughts that other speakers here today have. And the first of which is to really think about how we can work at the intersections of different social issues. Um, it's an election year, as many people have said. Um, and when we've been looking at public polling um, again and again and again, sort of the top three issues that are coming to mind for folks that we're sharing this space with are the real sort of bread and butter pocketbook issues. So housing, healthcare, affordability. And I think it used to be that the conversation was, you know, okay, how can we propel climate into one of these top three and knock something out? What can go to four or five and like, how can we get climate into one, two or three uh, in an election year? Um, and I'm so thrilled that we as a movement are evolving to a space where we, instead it feels like the conversation is and needs to continue to be, how can we do a better job of underscoring the ways in which climate justice uh, is a pocketbook issue, right? That housing justice, tenant justice, um, you know, justice for unhoused folks like is a form of climate justice and that these struggles are interlinked and that when you act on one, you can act on others. Um, and how does climate action make life more affordable for people? Like how is taking, you know, an action around anti-poverty um, or accessibility or climate really all taking the same action? How can we find ways to compete less with the other social change movements that we believe in and know to be vitally important and instead increase that collaboration so that we can show people that you don't have to choose an issue. All struggles for justice are inherently linked. And when we work together well, we can show people that a, a sort of an action that you take on one is an action that you take on all. Um, and to me, that feels really inspiring because there's any number of things that we all care about um, no matter where you live. These, these things affect all of us. Um, so working at the like intersection spaces to me feels really important. Um, I think the second one, which a lot of other people have spoken about too, is working in communities. Um, relationships are so often the things that both bring people to movement spaces and keep people in them. Sometimes people are really driven by a story around climate, but it's the people that they meet, that they work with, that they take action with that often keep them in a space, especially when it gets hard. Or sometimes you get brought to a meeting by a person that you know. Um, and so even though these are, you know, the issues are the things that we care about, so often it's the people that actually keep us around and get us through things. And so uh, I think I think about like, how are we growing that number of people and how are we actually creating real opportunities to outreach to people that like aren't in our movement yet? How are we showing up in um, public spaces, in at community events, 
um, doing canvassing in different areas and telling a more compelling and more beautiful story than the really isolating sort of fear-driven narrative that I think is being pushed at us a lot um, by both world events and the reality of what we're seeing um, in the land and and in climate. Um, and I really believe in that. That's definitely been my story. And it's something that I think about a lot is like, how can we bring new people in? How can we actually really outreach to create communities that are stronger and taking action together? Um, because we we all are part of different communities that may not feel climate based, but could be, especially if we're really making those links between, you know, the action that people are already taking and how that can be a climate action. Um, the third thing that really came to mind for me is uh, like the satisfaction of holding bad actors accountable. Right. There is like so little action today that I think we can take that feels like truly impactful and truly inspiring and truly hopeful. But we need to feel hope and we need to feel inspired. And I think there's nothing more satisfying than really calling out and holding to account bad actors that are responsible for um, so many of the emissions that are so rapidly um, exacerbating the climate crisis. And so um, I really want to think more about like, how are we um thinking about the social license that fossil fuel companies have gained um, and holding them account in the places that we live for the harm that they've done. Um, I've timed myself, I'm over my five minutes. So I'm gonna just sort of leave it there for some food for thought. And uh, it's my absolute pleasure to reintroduce someone who needs no introduction, um, but uh, reintroduce Guy Dancy, who works to develop a positive vision uh, of a sustainable future and to translate that into action. As you, many of you may know, he's the co-founder of this West Coast Climate Action Network, and he's the author or co-author of over 10 books, which is incredible, including The Climate Challenge, 101 Solutions to Climate Warming or Global Warming. Um, and stay tuned because his latest book, The Economics of Kindness, will be published this summer. Thanks, Kiki. Um, so let me jump right to it. Three ideas on the question, what are the three most effective things climate action groups can do to accelerate progress in climate movement, BC's climate movement? My number one is if we can all pull together for the big campaigns. Every week in Weekend Newsletter, we publish one top priority action. If we all use this and act on it, we could you know, have a bigger impact. So we need to mobilize all of our supporters in every climate action group to get behind the big campaigns, such as the Stop LNG campaign, Stand Offset's campaign to tell the Royal Bank of Canada to stop funding climate destruction and respect indigenous rights. The Wilderness Committee's campaign right now to take fossil fuels out of BC's climate plan. The West Coast Environmental Laws Campaign to get councils to sign the declaration to sue Big Oil. The Nanaimo Climate Action Hub's campaign for transparent pricing on heat pump installations to stop the price inflation that is nullifying the value of the rebates. The Let's Ride campaign for safe, affordable, province-wide public transit, which is being supported by the Union of BC Indian Chiefs and 15 other organizations. And a shared campaign that might raise a climate strength tied to this year's provincial election. That's number one. It's all pulled together on the big campaigns. Number two is big visionary ideas. So there's evidence that many people have stopped reading about the climate crisis and similar things because the coverage is also negative. They're just turning off. However, many of these same people say that they go back to following the news if there were positive stories about climate progress and solutions and about the positive initiatives people are taking. And as the climate groups, we need to go big with big solutions and positive stories about green affordable housing, the rapid progress of solar or wind, cities around the world that are providing free public transport. Stories that lift the spirit, make people feel hopeful. We need to go big, big solutions such as, you know, um, Seth's idea there, free heat pump for every household earning less than 70K and for every rental unit. So as several people have said, the public's number one concern right now is the cost of living crisis. We need to show how the climate solutions can reduce the cost of living through reduced heating and cooling bills, less need to own a car, the carbon tax rebate checks, call it the climate action dividend altogether. And conversely, as Kai said, let people know that LNG is gonna increase the price of gas for everyone who still depends on it. So my third one is called climate action strengths and needs analysis. As a climate action group, I think we could strengthen the movement if each group 
took the time to do a climate action strengths and needs analysis to explore practical questions about your group. Like, are, are we reaching out to find who our climate, climate allies might be in local schools, in labor unions, First Nations, anti-poverty groups, businesses, social justice groups, to support their campaigns in a spirit of reciprocity so that we can build a broader campaign? Are we building relationships with municipal councillors, regional directors and municipal staff who support more rapid climate action so that we know what's needed and when they need our support? Are we doing enough events and activities to engage the public? Are we engaging with our MLAs and MPs so that we know when to urge them on, when to tell them that they're ignoring the climate crisis? If groups attending this CAPA would like, we can to develop a, a climate action strengths and needs analysis, I could take this back to our members team and we could see if we could come up with the first draft. So that's my thing, all pulled together with big campaigns, big visionary ideas, and that's climate action strengths and needs analysis. So with that, I want to pass on to our final speaker, our MC for this evening, Anjali Apadurai. Anjali is an organizer and climate justice campaigner. She got her start in international climate struggles, working with social movements from across the global South. She's now the director of campaigns with the Climate Emergency Unit, working on a campaign to get Canada to contribute its fair share to the international effort. She's run for office twice, both times successfully demonstrating the power of climate justice movement. Over to you, Anjali. Thank you so much, Guy. And uh, thank you so much to the organizers of uh, the weekend for this incredible lineup of speakers and for including me on that. Okay, putting my speaker hat on. I'm gonna try to be quick. We are running a little over time. I hope that this is uh, still energizing and exciting for everyone. I know it is for me. Um, I wanna add, you know, there's been such a breadth of wisdom already shared um, across all facets of climate action. And I want to add one more facet, which relates to the work that I'm doing. And I want to leave you with a bit of a global view. Um, so my, my first action, my action number one is solidarity and internationalism. Uh, we, as climate organizers and as advocates for the earth and for a new way of being with the earth, we must understand for ourselves that the problem of climate justice is fundamentally an international one. It's global. We are interconnected to every part of this planet and all the inequalities of the world, including colonialism and economic justice, play into that. So impoverishment, post-colonial legacies, land dispossession, and the widening gap between the ultra-wealthy and the majority of the world. All of these inform the scale and the magnitude and the solvability of the climate crisis. And one thing is very clear, climate change knows no borders. So despite how difficult it is to grasp the enormity of it, despite the temptation to dismiss struggles on the other side of the world as unrelated, that only works against us. Because if we only focus on our struggles here, and even if we are 100% successful in our struggles here, but we fail to recognize how our struggles are interconnected with the struggle for climate justice in other parts of the world, then we, we will have failed as a whole. This is a, this is a global test. And so right now that looks like uh, a shift in perspective. I don't really have a very concrete action on this other than keeping in mind that that feeling of uh, that sense of internationalism and, and keeping a more expansive view of the struggle for ourselves. Um, so when there's a war on the other side of the world, like what's happening in Gaza right now, we understand that these are manifestations of the instability, the resource scarcity, the oppression caused by the powerful forces that exploit our planet with immunity and deepen divisions for their own personal gain. And so to stand with all oppressed peoples around the world is the only way to win on this massive challenge of our times. So that's number one, solidarity and internationalism. You'll hear more from me on that because my the campaign that I'm working on this year has to do with Canada's contribute international contribution or our fair share as it's known. So we'll be doing some webinars and some educational stuff on that leading up to the next big fancy UN COP uh, this year. Uh, number two is, um, I'll keep this one short because this is something that most of the speakers have actually touched on, and that is to meet our neighbors where they're at. 
um, I just want to uh, underscore the importance of building relationships because relationships are the bedrock and the only way to get through this crisis. If care is the opposite of exploitation, then the only way to get out of the deadlock of exploitation that has actually created the climate crisis is to practice care. And when we practice care, it is the most low carbon thing we can do. And it's the only way for us to be able to understand the struggles of those among us who are who are falling through the cracks of this terribly unequal system that we live in. It's the way to understand that the struggles of the most vulnerable among us are fundamentally climate struggles. So it is hard to care about heat pumps when you're struggling to afford housing. So we have to meet people where they're at. We talk about the desperate need for adequate cooling measures in homes, something that was absolutely missing when we had the deadly heat wave that rocked the province in 2021, where 700 lives were lost. And when we start the conversation from there, you know, why don't we have these cooling measures? That's when something like heat pumps can come into the conversation because that's obviously a good solution to the problem. Right now at the Climate Emergency Unit, part of my work is I'm working with South Asian communities in an, in an attempt to bring new folks into this movement. And so when we think about things like affordability, I think Kai touched on this issue. This is an issue that may hit newcomers and immigrants differently. So how do we bring these folks into the movement? And when a climate disaster happens halfway across the world, like the flooding in Pakistan that had one third of the country underwater, how are we reaching out to folks who have family in other parts of the world and helping them name the connections between that climate event and policy choices that are happening here? All of that happens through relationship and it's upon all of us as climate advocates to recognize that our movement needs to grow at an unprecedented pace and we need to be finding new ways of building relationship and bringing new people in. And number three uh, is to dare to ask for big things. And this is a lesson I have learned very clearly through my life experiences. It's very tempting to fall for the prevailing political norm, that we somehow have to meet politicians where they're at, which somehow often means only asking for incremental policy solutions. And we're told that to ask for big transformative programs that fundamentally challenge business as usual is simply too much. But the history of how social change has actually happened tells a very different story. The course of history has been fundamentally changed at countless points by organized groups of people, like all of us in this room today, daring to demand change that seems impossible given the prevailing culture and political norms of the time. Our movement has experienced incredible victories, like the LNG announcement that just came out uh, south of the border, or the pipeline cancellations that we've all been a part of. And you know, the success of political candidates like Bernie Sanders, for example, also tell the story. If you dare to ask for big things and you dare to paint a pathway to a future in which the social, political and economic relations of society are organized completely differently, you create this big, beautiful on-ramp for new people to come into our movement and for them to throw their energy behind this vision for a climate safe future. I learned this when I ran for office. This was a really big political lesson that um, I would love to convey because it was so powerful and potent. We dared to paint a picture of a climate safe future in which uh, we had a fundamentally different relationship to the land and to each other. And people came on board for that vision. And we can do that again and again and again as a movement. So to achieve the world we want, we have to ask for it. And I'm going to end there. We are a little over time. Uh, so I want.